Welcome back to another UNC Tar Heels basketball podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. And if you are watching us on our super fast, and I mean super fast growing YouTube channel, our quest for 10,000 is almost complete. And then we'll have a new quest. That is called Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones. And joining me is our director of basketball recruiting and analyst, longtime college AAU and high school coach, Mr. David Siskin. David, I think we did one of these a week or two ago. They're all running together. This is the time of year where everything just gets piled into one super long day with a few cat naps tucked in and, and we're rolling along. We're basically going to focus on the last week. North Carolina getting a win over Syracuse. Tar Heels pushed, and Caleb Love came up big late, kind of showing a, another sign that there is a lot of dog, a lot of screw you in his game. And then the whole team brought screw you to their game to Cameron Indoor Stadium Saturday night, spoiling Coach K's final home game at Cameron Indoor Stadium. David, a lot of people have heard my take on this, so let's get your take. How surprised were you by the Tar Heels' performance? And part two to that question, how surprised were you that the Tar Heels excelled in the manner that they did, go using the ball screen as effectively as they did to beat the Blue Devils? To start out, uh, I'm more surprised than you were. I gave you a shout-out on Twitter earlier today that you have actually, uh, you called this. And um, I know privately, you told me, gosh, two or three weeks ago, while we were off the air, you know, just talking about generalities, you said, look, I'm not overall over all uh, impressed with Duke that they're a great team. I think North Carolina can go in there and, and beat them. And I just kind of blew you off. And then, uh, and then, you know, you had a podcast last week where you said that you said, I'm not predicting a win, but you said it wouldn't surprise me. And you also said, I, I think it's going to be a, a highly competitive game. Yeah. You know, it was, I don't think that you can attribute the loss to Duke being distracted because it was Coach K's final game and, and the whole circus that, that went around it. Um, <clears throat> obviously, North Carolina got out to an early start. Duke might have been distracted right off the bat, but they came back, took a nine-point lead, I think it was, in the first half, had an eight-point lead in the second half. Um, I thought there were some big things. I think if you'll go back to it and look at the final two to three minutes of the first half with Baycott, out of the game, I thought Duke, North Carolina did some good things, and I thought Duke shot themselves in the foot. Uh, you know, they had a chance really to stretch the lead, and, and you, you're sitting there thinking when Baycott goes out, it's about an eight- or ten-point game, and I'm thinking, man, this thing could get to 12 to 15 in a hurry. Yep. Instead, it went the other direction. Duke missed two front ends of a one-and-one. One. Uh, uh, Roach, Jeremy Roach, got just, his cage rattled on the screen, and he's staggering around out there. And Duke's playing four on five, basically, and they hit a three in a corner. And then he hit another three, and you got a ball game. Uh, some very good adjustments. You go into the second half. You know, uh, North Carolina started out with Leaky Black on uh, Paola Bancaro. Bancaro was too big, just as quick, but 50 pounds bigger. And, and Leaky, this was one of the few guys that he had no answer for defensively. Brady Manick did a tremendous job in the second half. Baycott even did a really good job on him. Uh, and, and you could tell as the game went in the second half, you're thinking halfway through going down the stretch. I know I was watching on television. I'm like, my goodness, North Carolina is in a good shape to win this game. And I'm going to tell you why. It had nothing. They were ahead, but it really didn't have anything to do with the score. They were scoring a lot easier on their end than Duke was and, and Duke, even when they were making buckets, they had to work for them. North Carolina in that middle ball screen, and even when they went to the tandem with Baycott and Manic, as we did on the film review, they were shooting fish in the barrel. I mean, it was just easy for them, I, I felt like. Duke had no answers. Uh, I think you saw Coach K after the game when he spoke uh, in the festivities to everybody that was there. He was frustrated. 
And obviously he's going to do that when he loses. But I, I, I know coaches, you're frustrated when you feel like your team falls apart. And North Carolina had them totally confused on the defensive end. They had no answers. I mean, that had to really bite for him, you know, that, that he couldn't guard them. And then on the other end, like we said, North Carolina, they guarded Ben Carroll well. They made Duke work. I think Duke offensively, too. I didn't want to tweak this earlier in the game in the first half because they were ahead. They were shooting um, 50% from the field. And obviously, you put that up. And you're trying to watch a game. You don't have time for a Twitter war during the middle of the game. <laughs> but but I, I thought Duke, and you may agree with me, I thought Duke had a lot of empty possessions throughout the game. Yes. Where they forced jump shots early. And you felt like in the first half they could get to the rim whenever they wanted to. They settled for jump shots. In my opinion, they're not a good outside shooting team. And then you got the second half. They had to work. They they blew their opportunity. They had to work for shots in the second half. And North Carolina got whatever they wanted. And North Carolina didn't settle. They got to the rim. They kicked out. They had wide open threes. The ball went inside out. Great ball movement. Good reads and selfish. The better team won Saturday in Cameron Indoor Arena. You know, a couple of things I want to want to hit on there. I, I think your point about Duke in the second half <clears throat> is something that really kind of struck me uh, watching from my vantage point in there that it looked like a lot of the baskets the Blue Devils were getting were Band-Aid baskets. It's like, it, it's like they weren't great possessions and someone hit a shot, but it wasn't good basketball. It's just a guy hitting a shot. And you know exactly where I'm going here. Carolina – was getting shots. They were hitting shots, but they were creating it through everything that they were doing. It was five guys. I'm not going to say it was symphonic because people make fun of me when I use words like that, but at times basketball can be symphonic. And I think today the use of the ball screen, the way that they did and some of the wrinkles they threw with it. And the fact they got layups, they got floaters and they got kickouts for threes. They got everything you could possibly want. And they weren't just threes. On the wing, there was one that you pointed out in your film review when Brady came out and got the three at the top of the key. That was gorgeous basketball. And on the other end of the court, Duke was hitting some shots, but they weren't getting that kind of symphony going on. In fact, there was a long time with Duke. I think at one point, even the first half, Duke, 14 field goals, they had like three assists. So they, they didn't have a lot of connectivity with a lot of what the Blue Devils were doing. I think some of that had to do with the Tar Heels. I think the Tar Heels surprised them at how well they were defending him in some areas. Now, Duke did get a lot of points at the rim. And Barcaro had a good half. He was able to drive and get to the rim. They got some dump downs and stuff like that. But if you kind of look and weigh the totality of Duke's offensive efficiency, I would imagine their coaches did not give them a very high mark. Disregard shooting percentage. That's just the ball going to the basket. There's a lot of other stuff that goes into it. And I think the Tar Heels affected a lot of what the uh, Blue Devils wanted to do. Let's go to both ends here and, and, and touch on your thoughts. Because there, obviously, there's so many directions we can go. Yeah. But let's look at defensive, the defensive end first. When Baycott was out of the game, and the reason I'm saying this, we're, we're, we're talking about, as you said, Duke scoring easily in the first half. When Baycott was out of the game, Duke was bigger. And so Linky Black's got to go back to Ben Caro. Um, Manic has got to guard Williams. Manic, I thought, did a better job on, believe it or not, on Ben Caro than he did Williams because Williams seven foot seven one. He was too big around the lane. And, and then ben, uh, uh, Manic's got to go help because Leaky Black, a smaller Leaky Black, is is on Ben Caro, and Ben Caro's just having his way with him. So that turned Williams loose inside. Duke was too big. In the second half. Uh, there were no substitutions. I thought that was very interesting on Hubert's part. Hubert was very conservative in the first half. He took uh, Baycott out with one foul, and he was out for a while. Five and, and a half the, minutes. The early lead was gone, okay? The early lead that they have disappeared with him on the bench. Then he took him out the final three minutes, and that was a huge risk as we've already talked about. But I felt like he must have been thinking, coaches think this out, I'm going to try to buy him time in the first half. We'll go to the bench a little bit. We'll sub early. We'll be conservative. 
But in the second half, I think, and I've done it before, he go over, get your rest now because you are not coming out in the second yeah. half. I don't care if you have 10 fouls. I'm not taking you out. So they did that, and with Baycott on the floor, it was a bigger lineup. I think you've got to go big against Duke. They will manhandle you if you go to a smaller lineup. Now, here's – to me, the thing that made North Carolina effective, well, you think, okay, if you can spread a team out in the ball screen, you're thinking about a bunch of guards. They're too quick, okay? That wasn't the case. If you go with a bunch of guards, Duke is going to just punish them inside with all that size they got. North Carolina was able to play a sizable lineup with a 6'10 Manic, with a 6'10 Baycott, with a 6'8 Leaky Black, a big lineup, and still just, like I said, absolutely have their way with them in the half court in, in the middle ball screen. I, I heard you on your podcast. Who was it you said that you thought was the greatest ball screener or the greatest screener in the history of the ACC? Brian Zubek. When, well, when Coach, Coach K moved him into the starting lineup and just said, be the greatest ball screener ever about early February 2010, and that was like the last piece to the puzzle that made them a national champion, in my opinion. Was Greg Zubek one of the 90, 80-something, 90-something Duke players that came back? Yeah. Was he yeah. there? Uh, yeah. The, Greg Kubek, you mean? Kub, whatever. Kubek. Kubek yeah. Kubek. I'm not sure if he was there or not. I didn't recognize I only recognize the guy. I remember Tony like Kubek, Joe Garagiola, when I was a kid. I'm telling Listen, Tony Kubek, that's right. They were the, they were the B team on NBC. Let me say this. If he was there at the game, he took a torch like he was at the Olympics. He lit it, and he reached out, and he handed it to Armando Baycott and said, I am passing the torch to you. You are now the greatest screener in the history of the ACC. Because I'm going to tell you, I can't, it didn't matter if they were in the single ball screen, if they were in the horns look, if they were in the ball screen, back screen deal. They He single-handedly wrecked the Duke defense because the guards either yeah. put their head right there in his pecs or either they had to run 10 yards out of the way over the top to get around him. They there were At no time yesterday – could they get through his screens? He wrecked the Duke ball screen offense. There was one play in particular. I did a film review on it. It's on Twitter. It's on a film review. On Twitter, I talked about the ball screen back screen that they do when Manic pops, when uh, uh, Baycott sets the first screen and rolls, he gets the back screen going to the rim for Manic. Manic pops. They shoot the three. And I said, you know, Hubert had a wrinkle. Instead of that, Baycott ball screened and went down and screened Manic out to the top for the three. But if you'll notice, I put an edit in the story, and I said, you know something? His ball screen blew that play up so much, it wasn't a wrinkle. The more and more I looked at it, he set such a good ball screen that three Duke players fell over the top of each other trying to get – to Caleb Love on a drive. And there was nobody there to screen. That's why it looked like that he was sitting two screens. There was nobody there. He's single. It, it looked like bowling pins going down for Duke from that one ball screen from Baycott. He destroyed yeah, them with his ball screens, with his you know, screening. I asked Caleb. We we had we actually had some in-person stuff. David, I, I, I love that. We're getting closer to getting back to normal. We had Hubert, Armando, and RJ in the media room, so at least it was still in person. Then we had Brady and Caleb just outside the locker room, and I asked Caleb about the effectiveness of the ball screens, and he said we knew that if we got the screen made and, <clears throat> and they switched, that uh, Mark Williams and Paolo could not guard either guard. They couldn't stay with them. And, it, and what I thought was, was interesting is that uh, Caleb and RJ, and I thought RJ was outstanding when he got into those switches, that uh, they were able to get to the rim in a layup. <clears throat> a couple times, RJ dribbled through. You talked a few weeks ago about a guard that can drive. I think you were talking about Kia Clark or something like that, guard that can dribble through and still find guys. I think one of the times that our RJ 
got uh, one of the switches and a big on a switch. And instead of going up and shooting, he just kept dragging him through the lane and kicked out outside and got a three there. They were getting that. They were getting floaters in the lane. RJ hit a floater in the lane when there was nobody there. I think you actually highlighted that in your film review as well. And then there were some other kickouts and drops. And I, and also, you know what it did a couple of times in one real key sequence is it opened up some offensive rebounding opportunities because Duke was totally out of position. And there was one in which Carolina got three offensive rebounds and ended with Mickey Black getting a huge putback. That was one of those, <clears throat> if there's six nails in a coffin, that was one of the nails in that. Because that showed you, I thought, that Carolina was springier at that point than Duke was, even though they weren't subbing and Duke played more guys. The Tar Heels looked fresher and they were springer because their minds were right. I think Duke was stressing a lot because they didn't expect Carolina to play not only as well as they did, but have success in some of the ways they did have success. You know, and it's interesting uh, and hearing it from somebody that was there. And, and by the way, I already had this plan to say this today. I don't know – what you get paid a year, it's none of my business. But you have probably had a $50,000 seat last night of, of being there. You're So I, I'm, I was I'm, working. I, honestly, the, people ask me, boy, how was it? I was I, like, I don't really know. I told you, and I'll sidebar here for a moment. We'll go back to what you were saying. I, you know, I always allow myself to take in a moment to, because, because I'm very blessed to do what I do. It's, it's an enormous job, as you well know. Uh, it, it's not, it's, it's a lot different than most people realize, but the moment after Coach K took the photo with the 96 former players that were on hand, anybody that knows Cameron, basically think of a massive, massive gym. And on one end, Duke runs out from that corner through a set of doors. On the other end, it's the visiting team. Well, the 96 players that former players that were there, they were going to exit through the door where the Carolina team comes out and get organized, do whatever they were going to do, right? Well, they were getting ready to walk through and they had to stop. The security held them off because here came the Tar Heels, their final run out of the court for a quick layup line before the game started. And I swear, at least half of those Duke players, and we're talking about, I don't know if Grant Hill had his phone out, but we're talking about those kind of guys and all the in-between, a lot of real stuff, the al abdul Nabis of the world. Half of them had their phones out and they were videotaping Carol running out of the tunnel. Uh, that's one of those you'll never see this ever again in the history of humanity moments that I that I did take in for a moment. That was kind of cool. Sidebar and back to what you were saying. Go ahead. And and and, and I didn't get fifty thousand dollars for that game. Probably got about five bucks in a bag of peanuts. You'll, so. you'll have to remind me, Matt. I don't know what we were talking about before. Yeah, I, I'm. <laughs> well, this I, I had. I, this is I, not, I was this, just. This is Larry yeah. David curb your enthusiasm. There, you, there you go. Um, but <laughs> that's pretty but, good. No, no I was uh, just talking about the screening and the way Carolina was able to get into the switches. And and as Caleb said, "What we knew that Mark Williams and Apollo could not guard us on the switches." I know what we were. I know what I was going to say. Uh, watching on television, Jay Billis made the statement of about eight minutes left. He said, North Carolina, Hubert Davis has not went to the bench one time. Yeah. So they're going to have to battle. Well, they have fresh legs here at the end of the game. And, and as you know, it's a sauna in there when it's full. Oh, and uh, so, you know, that that's a statement right there. North Carolina was the fresher team and basically played five players the last 20 minutes, never subbed out. You know, when you're talking about guys like Baycott, you know, carrying a lot of weight around with them. And uh, so that's impressive, and, you know, and they just, it just closed and closed and closed. And, um, you know, they kept stretching the lead out and, and they closed that game and they kept stretching it. And you knew at about three minute mark, this, this game's over, you know, bar and a miracle. It's just because they could just do what they wanted to do offensively. Yeah. It's hard to come back. If you're Duke, once you fall behind, it's hard to come back when the other team can get any look that they want because it's basically out of your control. You're, you're just at their mercy, and you just hope they miss some easy shots. So, you know, for North Carolina to do what they did, like I said, playing five in that kind of environment, that kind of stress, but that kind of heat and humidity in that gym, uh, you know, that says a lot for the team's not only physical conditioning but mental conditioning. I want to ask you about Caleb Love in a minute, but I'm let's stay on the the minutes played. Carolina played two games this week. One went to overtime. So of the possible 425 minutes Hubert had to distribute, 
the starters, and I'm going to say starters, even though Caleb didn't start senior night, Ryan McAdoo did, the starters played 392 of the 425 how minutes. Out of how many? 392 out of 425. How sustainable is that? Or may, I've told some people about a month ago, I said, you know what? I think Hubert knows this is his group. This is his core. He's got the run with these guys. And he's not subbing for some of the other dudes now because he wants to get these guys conditioned to play through stuff because when they get to March, the only way this team makes a run is if those five are on the floor 97% of the time. So he's going to get them into game. And game shape isn't just running and conditioning. It's going through stuff. It's dealing with the changes that four different guys guarding you in a 10-minute stretch, that kind of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. I think that's what Hubert was doing, and that's what we saw this week. So how sustainable is that, though, now going into an ACC tournament where they, they'll have to play consecutive days if they advance? And then the NCAA tournament, at least you have a day in between, but it's a strenuous preparation, do If you win in the first round, you get the next day to have, like, a ton of prep for a team that you knew nothing about a couple of days before. Uh, so how sustainable is it, David? I've thought about this. Um because you're getting into the conference tournament. You know, Bobby Knight hated the uh, conference tournaments. He was totally against it, you know, ever, ever coming in. And I, I would think if I got a short bench and I knew I was going to be in the NCAA tournament, I wouldn't crazy, be crazy about it. Of course, the, the ACC is a different deal. The ACC tournament has always been there, and it's legendary. You know, it, it, so I think the tournament probably in ACC probably means more in most places. So I'll give you an example. John Calipari's got to kind of do a lot of the same things in Kentucky. He's probably going to have Alabama, Tennessee, and either Auburn, Arkansas, or LSU on Sunday if he got all the way through Friday, Saturday, Sunday, playing five to six guys and, and playing guys like Shebway and all those guys 38 minutes. If I'm them, your best case scenario is to go out on Saturday – and how Tennessee beat you at the buzzer. So you're not playing on Sunday. You're not playing three days. You're not worrying about guys getting hurt. They're not wore out going into the to the uh, NCAA tournament. But North Carolina is a little different story because I know how important the, the – and I'm going to ask you this. You're closer. You know. You've got a better idea than I do. So I would ask you this. What would be more important to Hubert? And then we're going to go back and address this, but I feel like we, we need to frame it first. If you're Hubert Davis, here's my question. What is the most important? Making a run to the ACC Tournament Championship on Sunday or getting out of the first weekend of the NCAA Tournament? I said he want, he's kind of old school. Well, he's not kind. He's really old school. And in fact, if you have watched the ACC tournament documentary series last week, uh, one of the focuses was on some of the games that Carolina played when Hubert was in school. That 1989 ACC tournament championship game between Duke and UNC was an absolute war, and it was extremely important. And Carolina and Duke did the same thing for, uh, for the next several years. I think that if they, I think he wants to win a title because you are the official champion. People forget this, but Georgia tech was the official ACC basketball champion last year. So I think they want to hang a banner because there's no guarantees getting in the next one. And if they can get hot and win something, I don't think that they would do an either or deal. I think you take what's in front of you and, and get it while you can. What's interesting is that in Roy's three national championships at Carolina, those three UNC teams uh, which were all the top team in the league in the regular season, they uh, they all finished, uh, lost in the semifinals of the ACC tournament, didn't even get to the finals. I think, and I'd get run out of town in a lot of places, but I think getting the beaten in the, in the semifinals of your conference tournament is probably the way to go, uh, no matter what. Could, because could be, but, but you don't want to lose in the first round on Friday. You don't want to lose a 7-2 or, or have the 13 seed beat the 7 seed. and then they, You don't want that. Yeah. But here's the thing. if you go, and We've seen it before. How many times have we seen a team, in, in no matter the league, Power 5 league, Big 10, Pac-12, SEC, ACC, yeah, whatever, over. Big 12, 
You know where I'm going. Yep. Win the conference tournament, and guess what? And then when you do all the bracket shows, they go, look, this is the hot team. They yep. want it. Put them in your final four. They, 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 they're smoking, man. They're red hot. And what happens? They get put out on Thursday. You yeah. out- win, win a title Saturday, they're out Thursday. I've seen it happen a lot. Here's the thing. It, it's a mental thing, too, because now you're trying – you won that tournament – and all of a sudden, you're the coach, and you've got to say, hey, we got that. Okay, great. You won a conference tournament. We got our first game against Slippery Rock Thursday. Uh, or okay. someone like North like, – like if let's say North Carolina wins in Brooklyn. Heels could climb up to like a five maybe. I really think because because Michigan won Sunday at Ohio State. That's going to be a, a Q1 game. If the Hokies win a couple times in Brooklyn, that home win over them could become a Q1 game. So let's say Carolina for the sake of discussion. And then you're playing Murray State. Well, maybe. Or more than that, someone like North Texas. Murray State at least is ranked. Huber could sell. Any coach could sell that their team. I mean, one of the best players in the NBA came from there a couple years ago, and they're ranked. But someone like North Texas, who's been cruising through Conference USA, probably supremely confident, or someone like Iona, Imagine selling that to your kids after winning a championship as prestigious as the ACC. So I'm with you right there. But I think this group, given what Hubert and the team have, what these kids have been through for a couple of years and Hubert being in his first year, if he could put a banner up in the same year that they spoil Kay's final home game, I think he'll stuff that in his back pocket and sprint to the ocean for a week off. And I, I, let me add this too. Let, about the physical aspect of it then, okay? One thing, too, about going into that tournament. And I guess I'm just a guy that thinks more NCAA tournament than I do conference tournament. You play three games in a row, and you've got uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we have a short bench, and you're playing starters. Man, you're tasking guys to go 120 minutes, just an all-out warfare, and then be ready to go, you know, in first round of the tournament. And I think that takes a huge toll. So I, I guess, and that's why I asked the question, you know, and, and obviously Hubert's probably in a different situation than most coaches. So it's going to be very interesting because I don't think you can say, if you're 12 deep, that's one thing. But I don't think you can lump them together and say, okay, can they win the ACC tournament and then make a deep run in the NCAA tournament? They may be able to do it. I'm not blowing that off. I'm not saying no. Here's what I'm saying. You've got to treat them separately. You know, yeah. if you can make a deep run, get to the finals, and then turn around, you then you've got the whole deal where you've got to regroup for the tournament. It, it, it's separate. It's like winning – it's like – it would be like winning the, the final game of the football season and you've got North Carolina State, who's a huge rival. Let's say you close on them and you win on an 80-yard Hail Mary. The, great, the Stanford band runs out on the field or something like that. You win it. And guess what? Then you've got to turn around and play Clemson uh, uh, the following Saturday after all that. So you, you've yeah. got to refocus. So it, 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 it's, it's tough physically and mentally. I think one thing that helps the ACC is when they move the championship game back to Saturday night, and I think it was 2015. Yeah, yeah that's big. Yeah. So you get that extra day, and, and, and that helps because, you know, if you play Saturday night in a championship game and you open up on Friday, then that's not bad. You should be able to handle that. And I know this yeah. isn't the exact simulation that we're talking about, but since Carolina's rotation was cut, since Dawson Garcia left, and went back home. Anthony Harris was long out, and Hubert was kind of trying to figure out who that bench guy would be. I say bench guy; he just would need somebody that can give him a little bit of, of a breather. They had that three games in one week stretch, and twice they've gone Saturday Sunday, or excuse me, uh, Saturday Monday in games. So they've been able to cram some stuff in a little bit and, and, and kind of gauge the test on the bodies and. They've done pretty well. I mean, they've won those Monday games, and they won those three that week when they played three games in, in five days, six, five and a half days or whatever it was. Of course, the competition uh, in, in, in large part wasn't what they're going to face. But 
I think that they've been preparing to have to do this. So at this point, it's not like a team suddenly whittling it down now in postseason and forcing your guys to play. Brady Manning played 40 and 43 and 40 minutes last week. He never played 40 minutes in his life at Oklahoma, but he did here. And people said two months, a month and a half ago, Brady Manning can't play more than 30 minutes. You got to keep maybe, maybe uh, cap him at 32. I, mean, I told people, he just, that's just his body language. That means tired. He just kind of looks that way. And lo and behold, he played 83 minutes this week. They had, uh, but all five starters yesterday, I think, were either they were over 40 minutes, I believe, except one, and and they all played the entire second half in that environment. I'm telling you, that building was hot, it was sweaty, it was nasty. It always is. So, it's an interesting thing. But I, I going back to your question though, I really believe they'll take an ACC title. Take what you can get now because you may not get what's next. And honestly. What do you get for getting to the Sweet 16 at North Carolina? That's not a whole lot. And the other part of that, too. Go ahead. Go well, ahead. I think Go every ahead. every time Carolina's won the ACC tournament, I believe they've at least gotten to the Sweet 16. This podcast is going to be 20 questions, Andrew. I got another one. <laughs> okay. All right. How – Roll reverse. Tell me, what, tell me what a win at Duke, in your opinion, does for Hubert Davis – I tweeted last night. I felt like after he won that game, he's a made man. Now, now that a made man's a short term. Yeah. Because, you know, if you don't come back two or three years later, you know, if you've not won an ACC title or you, you've, uh, I know how quickly like a Tubby Smith at Kentucky wins a national, he goes from being a national champion to three or four years later being called 10 lost Tubby. So, you know, if, if you, <laughs> If you have some of that um, and you you lose, you know, the record's not what the fans want. They don't get past the Sweet 16, whatever. Pain yeah. and worst case scenario here. But for now, you know, like we said, it, it looked like he was trying so hard to win a big game. It was like, and we've talked about it. Every game yeah. was just like life and death yeah. for him. Well, he's got it in – you know, you don't want to be a coach and somebody asks you, what was your signature victory? And you said, well, I really never had one. So he's got one. So, but And, and on the biggest of stages, you know, you could possibly have. So ha- how much does that take the pressure off him? Uh, funny quick story in a second. When you said made man, I couldn't help but think, imagine Hubert and Joe Pesci's threads when he was a made man <laughs> in Goodfellas. Uh, the, uh, yeah, Don, your... Pesci and Don Rickles. <laughs> That and that and if that's his signature moment, that's not good. I remember uh, when Seth Greenberg was at Virginia Tech, and we were at the ACC basketball tip-off, the media days, and um, I can't remember who. I think it was someone was talk, asked him a question about Paul Hewitt. He got an extension at Georgia Tech, and and Greenberg went on to talk about how the administration, you know, is putting trust and faith in and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm like we're sitting next to him. And I said, well, what does it say about your administration, the, the trust and faith they put in you to give you extension and, and see that, you know, the things moving forward slowly but surely? And it wasn't a slap. It wasn't a criticism. It was just, you know, <coughs> that was after the certifiably insane comments and stuff like that. And he got all riled up and started listing all the successes. And one of the successes he listed was we had ESPN game day here. Like that's you don't put a banner up that ESPN game day was in town and North Carolina is not going to put a banner up that they spoiled Coach K's final home game. So I think it helps. Uh, I think that Hubert, I think he's relaxed some in the last couple of weeks. He's relaxed. I think his demeanor on the sidelines a little different. And I think the reason he's got a little bit more sure of himself and sure of his team is because they've been winning close games. So if they go through a tough stretch in a game and they've handled some tough stretches, Duke had a 14 nothing run in the first half yesterday and Tar Heels responded. That club wouldn't have responded six or seven weeks ago. Hell, they didn't a month ago in Chapel Hill when Duke did it. But I think he's seen his team fight. He's seen them grit through some stuff and they've slowly accumulated some intangibles. A lot of the mental toughness stuff, a lot of the cohesion stuff. Twice last week, he said, this is the best our chemistry has been all year. I think that's relaxed him. I think that's one of the reasons they won last night. I think, and it's interesting, colleague asked him after the game if he believes that this win kind of validates him a little bit because there are a lot of people that have been questioning the hire from day one, and certainly since a lot of these routes have occurred. And Hubert, of course, went completely in another direction as if he had not heard any of that. And it's possible 
he hasn't heard any of it. But I do think the people who were questioning and concerned are certainly away from that ledge right now. But you know well as I do, if they play Virginia Thursday night, and the, and, the, and the Cavaliers hold them to 31% shooting and Caleb is two for 20 and they lose 58 to 42. The same people who were criticizing a few weeks ago, they'll be back on it because that's the way North Carolina fans are. He's not like Dean. He's Virginia. not Roy. He's you not had, Dean. And he, he talked about walking into a root canal. Wow. Yeah. He's not Dean and he's not Roy. And until he proves he's one of those guys, people are going to wait for him to be that. And if he's not, they're going to criticize him for it. You, that's you, the reality of the North Carolina job. You made a good point about winning close games. I remember one time, you know, in coaching high school, we lost a tough region game. I mean, just to the wire to go to state tournament, just just as bitter and brutal as it can be. And I'm going back to the locker room, and Andy Landers, who coached the women at Georgia's on the NCAA women's, his brother, a really good high school coach, girls high school coach in state Tennessee, and uh, we were in the same region, good guy. He told me, he said, you know, if you win, if, if you lose a blowout, it's a player's fault. If you lose a close game, it's a coach's fault. So, I, you know, and I said, thanks a lot, man. So, anyway, I know Hubert, um, you know, winning close games, I feel like you, you kind of feel like, coach, you're, you're making some of the right moves and it kind of validates you. So, yeah, I, I think that could – like you say, when I hadn't really thought about that, but winning close games could build to that comfort zone. And I'll tell you another great line I heard, and, and I, you had said something early uh, when you talked about Seth Greenberg. I heard Jerry Glanville say one time, and I loved it, when he took the head coaching job with the Falcons, they gave him a five-year rebuild and a two-year contract. And I thought that was one of the greatest lines I've ever heard. So, you know. He said, oh, he said a few lines. Yeah, hopefully Hubert's uh, Hubert Davis's contract will extend to rebuild. And you know, if you beat Duke at Cameron Indoor, that that helps the renegotiations and and uh, the extensions. So you know, he's off to a good start. Before I talk about a little bit more about what they do after now that they've defeated Duke, now they've they've collectively played that high end game. I do want to ask you about Caleb Love. 11 for 30 last week from the floor, but he scored 43 points. Yeah. And I thought that when they needed him to step up and be fantastic, he, he was. There is a dog in him. There's some screw you in his game. I think when he mouths with the, with the opposing students, especially on the road, I think that there's his game is better. I think that's you got to let him be some of that guy on the court because it fuels him. But to me, have you seen a player – in recent years that could go 11 for 30 from the floor and still so positively impact a victory. He's not great throughout the game, but he, I think he, he, he stresses opponents so much, even when he's missing, like they, they know that the next time he shoots, boom, he could take off and they don't want to give him that, that, that they don't want to give him that flint to, to, to ignite and take off. He gets to the foul line a lot. So you're, you're looking at, you know, I think, gosh, she was like two for 10 in the first half, but, you know. One for had, nine. Well, it was one for nine in the first half in this game. And he still had seven points, eight points, I think. So, you know, he's getting to the foul line. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a big thing. So if I'm coaching against him, you have scouting reports on people. And you're like, run them off the three-point line, make them finish in the lane or around the rim. And don't foul them. Bigs, don't foul. Make, so I, I think – but he's got a knack of doing that. He gets to the line a lot. But one big thing, too, he's not as scared of the big shot. He gets – he's better in the second half. I think we've seen that. He's like a slow starter out of the gate, and then, then he finishes down a home stretch, comes off the pace. Um, and, and, and like I said, he's not, he's not scared of the big play. Um Reminds me, the more I've watched him, reminds me of watching him back at Bashan when he was in in, in uh, high school of just making just high degree of difficulty shots. We've talked yeah. about this before. 35-footer yeah. off the crossover with three guys <laughs> hanging all over him. When he makes it, there's people running out of bleachers and around the court and all that. And there's one after another, and it's fun to watch – that's what he kind of does at North Carolina. So, 
I'm being, I just don't feel like when he does that, you can necessarily win with that. Um, and the reason I say that, that's why when they beat North Carolina State and some of the Florida State and some of these teams, when they did, and he's microwaving out there, you had to, it looks good, but I was very, very slow to accept that because I think in the long run, it'll bite you. Here's the thing. I didn't see any of that against Duke. He might not have made shots. So he might have missed some shots, and he warmed up. We know he warmed up in the second half. But it wasn't any of that and one mixtape tour stuff out there, yeah. 40 feet from a bucket, one-on-one, where it, it's, it's you know, he's putting on a show. Everything North Carolina did last night was in the flow of the offense. I have no problem with him shooting shots it's the shot selection and I thought his shot selection was pretty good last night much better than some of these other games and if you miss shots that's okay but shoot them in the in, in the rhythm of the offense you know high percentage shots and I, I thought he did better so eventually he's gonna heat up and if you got shots you can make then then you're really gonna heat up so I, I, I like that Caleb Love last night better than some of the other games I've seen, even when he's put up big numbers. Yeah, like I said, 11 for 30, but the last two games, he's 17 for 17 from the line. In fact, he's hit 36 consecutive free throws going back to the pit game, which, which, yeah, he's, which getting, he's getting to the line. You yeah, know, well, he's not, because of the shot. The way Carolina ranks their all-time leaders in certain categories, he's now qualified in uh, all-time leaders for free throw percentage, and he is currently at this moment the all-time UNC leader in free throw percentage. And and one of the guys who's on the top of that near the top of that list is uh, Jeff Lebo, someone who's actually helped Caleb a lot this year. When you look at his game, though, when I think of Caleb Love, I think Jeff Lebo. The hair, right? The flapping hair that Lebo, the little the hair that he had then and, and, and lost pretty soon after. The, the thing about Caleb, though, is I think you've got to take a little bit of the crap that comes in his game. You got to take a couple of the bad shots, a couple of the force shots, a couple of the force floaters. He had one last night. We're, we're recording this Sunday night in the first half where he he got by like three guys. It was one of the one-on-three things. It was like, you know, Curly uh, Neal from the Globe Trotter dribbling around a bunch of Washington generals and eventually getting to something, right? Problem is it wasn't Curly Neal. It wasn't the generals they were he was playing against. But he, he came in on the right side, sort of got in the lane and fired up maybe like a 15-footer. And Manic is behind him doing jumping jacks. <laughs> Like wide open. He could have flicked it behind him. Manic would have, there wasn't a Duke player within 10, 12 feet of Manic at least. And he never would have had time to recover. That part of his game is still growing. And I've tried to tell people the last couple of weeks that just because because Caleb has not met your expectations for your timetable for him, doesn't mean that he's not growing. Doesn't mean that his game's not developing because it is. But I still think he's at a stage in his process you're going to have to take some of the crap with it. It's just part of his game. And sometimes he has to go through that crap to get to where he is later in the game when he becomes a dog and takes over because that dude wants the ball. Go back to this three he hit the beginning of overtime at Louisville after he made that terrible play at the end of regulation. That's a dog mindset. Go back to how he demanded the ball late against Virginia Tech and hit all those free throws. That's a dog. Even the loss to Pitt. He scored 15 points in three minutes and 50 seconds inside the five minute mark to put them in position to maybe steal a the game. They had no business even being in. He's got that in him, but I think to get there, sometimes he's just got to go through some of the slop. Yeah. And that's the thing too, of just the scores mentality. Um, and I, I guess that's the thing too, when you I try to identify, you know, we said coming in, if you'll remember, um, when they were recruiting him and he signed, he was coming in. I, I'd spoken to someone who knew him well, and he said, Look, you'll remember this. He said, He's not a point guard. Yeah. And they've tried to play him at that role. So trying to find, because it's going to be ball centric a lot, it's tough when the ball's in his hand. So he's not a guy in the way North Carolina plays where you're running him off staggers. He, he's, not, he's not in a Reggie Miller Ray Allen mode where 
you're putting three screeners on the baseline and he's coming off of them, he's catching and firing. It's a lot in today's modern day game. Not only do you have two or three shooters on four, you got two or three ball handlers. So even when he's playing a two, he may be in situations in, in isolation and in ball screens. He's getting a ton of them. When you don't know who the point guard is, you don't know who the two guard is because they're basically doing the same thing in the modern day offense. So that's the thing. When he has that, he doesn't necessarily have a point guard mentality. It's always it, it's the scores mentality. So you know you got to know his big thing as he gets as he improves as he gets more mature of his game is being able to able to uh, differentiate those. But you think about it, how many of those guys in the NBA are like that, uh, that have that, can make the big shots. But, you know, it's like Larry Bird used to say, I never will forget Reggie Miller talked about when he coached the Pacers. And so he'd go into the locker room at halftime, and Larry says, Coach Bird says, what's, what's the deal, Reggie? He says, uh, you're one for nine. And he says, Coach, I'm not feeling it. I'm, I'm just not feeling it. And he says, how do you know you're not feeling it? I'm not mad at you that you're one for nine. He says, I want you to be one for 20. He said, how do you know you're not feeling it? You've not shot it enough yet. So mm -hmm. Reggie said he always remembered that. He said, yeah. you know, Larry Bird's whole thing was, hey, you got to shoot it in bulk before you know whether you're on or not. So that that's a scorer's mindset. So looking ahead to, and he certainly has that, looking ahead to the ACC tournament, um, I think the big question for this team, David, I mean, honestly, the way they've been, whatever they do, I immediately have to ask the question, well, how do they handle this? Whether they're coming off a blowout loss, whether they're coming off a big win, a narrow win, whatever it is, they, they've been so unpredictable in some ways that, you have to wonder, okay, well, does this affect the next game? Or can they cut the cord to this? I think we're going to find out about Hubert's ability to get them to move on from this. Because I know that Monday night after they beat Syracuse, Hubert was harping on Duke right away. Uh, Armando said that Hubert was more locked in than usual and it was locked in all week on Duke. So they invested a lot into that game. It wasn't just show up and, and play. A lot of their investment was to – ignore the noise. You know, Hubert gave him that Bible verse, Proverbs 425. He showed him a documentary of the 85 Lakers and, and Celtics when the Lakers got blown out in the first game and what they did to kind of reestablish their ground against the Celtics. And they, they successfully did it and won that series. But so much was put into it. Now they've got to slice the cord Regular season's gone. Now it's do or die stuff moving forward. I think it's going to be fascinating as someone who covers this team to see how Hubert handles it, to find out what his message ultimately is, and see how satisfied these, satisfied these kids are. Because the team bus went through Franklin Street when they came back, a sea of people. And there's a lot of stuff on social media about the players celebrating with students and stuff like that as if they won a championship. And like I said earlier, Nothing's going to be in a place that hangs up a lot of stuff. They're not hanging up this. So the question to you is, how do you think this club responds and gets going Thursday night, likely against a club like Virginia, which, by the way, can win a couple of games and play their way into the field? I'm looking at the bracket right now. So when I drop my head, that's what I've got. I've, I've got it pulled up right there. I have still, by the way, I've been so swamped. I still have not absorbed the bracket yet. I'm going to get it up on the site tonight. All right, so on North Carolina's side, Georgia Tech plays Louisville. The winner plays Virginia. Virginia's the six. North Carolina's the three. So you would have to think Virginia out of that one. Yeah. And, I mean, you talk about a matchup that makes you nervous because, like I said, you're just – you're going through the precision. You're going through the root canal. I'll say this. When I watched them play Virginia uh, earlier in the year – I was just like, man, is Tony Bennett quit recruiting? And I don't mean that as a slap toward him, but that they had guys on a team I'd never heard of before. <laughs> and they didn't look, and I've said it, they did not look like Virginia. Yeah. I'm like, man, they got guys on that team. How are they in the ACC? It's, it's, there's a couple of them. Statman's like that. There's a couple of them I just scratched my head about. 
So how? I mean, I guess to get to a six in the ACC and have a chance to play your way in tells you what kind of coach Tony Bennett is. Absolutely. I would have to think playing Virginia would get – you've said that would get their attention. Um, then after that, you know, uh, Virginia Tech, uh, you've got Clemson playing North Carolina State. Uh, the winner gets Virginia Tech. Uh, and then who knows what could happen there. Could you have an upset? And then the winner of that gets Notre Dame. So you could possibly see – odds are – you're probably going to see Virginia Thursday, Notre Dame Friday, and then you've got Duke, Miami, Wake Forest on that other side. I think Miami, Wake Forest in the quarterfinals at a four or five. Man, we thought at one time that might be one and two uh, in the ACC or definitely both of them in the top three and they both kind of altered down a stretch. I Man, I think really talented teams. So, um, if I, I think, like I said, uh, I think they're more talented than any of those teams on their side. I think they're definitely more talented than Virginia. Uh, I think they're more. Remember, talented. Hubert Hubert said in Winston Salem, after they got clobbered by the Hurricanes and Demon Deacons that week, he said, "Well, you know, Miami's got old guards, and Wake Forest got they're more talented than us." Of course. He may have been trying to send his guys a message there through us, which would be interesting because I've never sensed that he's done that otherwise. I, I but think, my, of course, I think they're more talented than those. I think they would love to play one of those two teams, but I think Wake's a horrible matchup for Carolina. I think that I, they would love to have Miami, especially more so than Wake, but they got to get past UVA. I think that's yeah, going to be tough because, because UVA is going to look at them the same way they look at Miami and Wake because they clobbered the Wahoos back in January. I would be more nervous about the, this to Virginia. Virginia, and, 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 you know, Tony Bennett knows how to win. And then you get Virginia Tech and Notre Dame in that other game. And I still don't trust Notre Dame. They're so finesse. And I think North Carolina would be chomping at the bit to get another shot at them. And you got to get I, stops in postseason. I think Virginia, and, Tech, Virginia Tech is, is, is kind of the same boat as uh, Virginia – I, they've just got guys on the floor, and you're like, how are they playing the ACC? And, and uh, so um, I like the side that they're in, and, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if they don't come out and they're not playing in the championship game Saturday. I think they could very well be the most talented team on that side, and I think they are the most talented team on that side. But if they end up playing Virginia or somebody, you know, um, in the quarterfinals – and they don't make it out, that wouldn't surprise you either. But, I mean, they, they don't need to go home the first game. I mean, they, they, yeah. they don't need to be a one-hit wonder. I think that uh, this is a tournament that they're, the champion could be someone who comes from outside the NCAA conversation, or certainly Virginia's considered the second four out or the next four out or something. I think that's far enough out when you've got other conference tournaments still to be played, but there will be some upsets that will steal bids. So if someone's going to come out and earn a bid in the tournament, that's not really heavily being discussed right now. Who do you think it'll be? My take is I think it's either Virginia or Syracuse for different reasons, but Virginia and Syracuse, I can see a scenario where they get kind of a fortunate uh, uh, bracket because maybe somebody loses in front of them, certainly, especially with Syracuse. And I could see one of them playing Saturday night. If a team like that's going to make it, those would be my two. They would be my two choices. If Syracuse wins and they would get Duke in the quarters, that's the only thing they're playing that one seed. Um, Hot. They got four guys that can explode on you. That can chuck. Yeah, I'm going to tell you this, and I know it's not. You talk about playing in. I, I, I'll detour just for a second. I would be scared to death of Miami or Wake Forest. One at the four, one to whoever wins that game if they end up playing each other. Because now I think both teams can just, 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 they can look like best teams to country. You saw what they did. And I'm surprised Miami makes bad decisions. I watched a little game up there. Um, we had some bad weather. I was on the treadmill and that kind of kept me entertained watching the, that game. On uh, Miami had them and just made some of the, and they won. 
but the game was much closer. Their decision yeah. making is is bad. But Wake Forest, but they're very talented. Very. Miami, talented. Miami tends to rely too much on guard play sometimes. Wake's got more balance. Wake Wake Forest could have beat anybody that night when they play, and they've got guys who are matchup nightmares. I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see them win it from the five. So, but but if I, I went on back, oh my gosh, I would have to say a team playing her way in just because of a track record. I mean, who wants to play Virginia? I mean, is there yeah. anybody in ACC tournament? I, I don't care if they do have guys that, you know, play about like you and I do uh, on that roster. I mean, there's yeah, nobody that's a, like, man, I'd love to play Virginia in ACC. Yeah, that's a rough one for Carol. They have to go from Duke and the way that game's played to then regenerate, get into postseason mode, cut the cord to being really satisfied with what you just did and you achieved something to now, oh, by the way, you know, here's UVA. <laughs> and, UVA's got, and UVA's gotten – they're better than they were – much better when Carolina played them before. They do have some nice players, and they've got a great coach. So, uh, let me ask you, so uh, – Let me say one thing. Yeah. And then we, when you go from Duke to Virginia, it's like going from – driving on an Audubon where you're going 180 – and you're having a time of your life and you're just freewheeling and just your hair's no wind and to, to driving over a, a bridge under construction when they got big, those big concrete barriers on both sides on the bridge and you've got about two inches on each side and you're just white knuckling it on the bridge and your eyes are like that all the way. That, that, I mean, that's what it is when you play with Jim. <laughs> From the out of under walking up Machu Picchu. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So who's going to win this thing? Let's see. I think I, I think you have to. I think if if K can get them regenerate, I think Duke wins it. I think I, Duke here, puts a lot into this thing. They win this. They they go out early in the here, it's the big tournament. Here's the thing, and I know they're talented. If you can't guard the ball screen yeah. in the day's game, it's like you saying, you know, we got a good football team, and I and but but our secondary, we just can't. We can't defend the pass. But maybe they do a better job. Maybe maybe Saturday night was one of those deals where K only focuses on that part of the game yeah. and, and hey. whips them one last time because he's so good at at taking one little thing and just magnifying it so much and, and they can fix it. I, I can see a scenario, David, where Duke – just they, they win it for K. Like it's a different kind of emotion, emotion that maybe they didn't have Saturday. They're able to channel into Brooklyn. They're not going to have the distractions at all up there that they had at home. And they put everything into it and they get them a banner, one last title. And then they go to the NCAA tournament the next weekend. They're done by the first weekend. I can see that scenario playing out. The most impressive team I saw North Carolina play in the ACC was Wake Forest. I'm going to pick Wake Forest from the five. Okay. Okay. I'm going to pick Duke. Do you think Carolina has a chance to win it? Or do you think it's just yeah. three games, three days, yes. starting out with UVA, which is a mental grinder as much as a physical grinder? Yes, I do. Because, like I said, I know Virginia is not – Virginia is a matchup that makes you nervous. But, look, on that side of the bracket, Clemson, North Carolina State, Louisville, Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, Virginia, and North yeah. Carolina. Who is the most talented team on that side? Hands down, yeah. North Carolina. I mean, uh, to, to, to me, it's not even close. Yeah. So, uh, Notre Dame, like I said, was a tough matchup. You played them up there. They were able to stretch the floor. North Carolina – I think North Carolina has gotten a little better – on, on defending these stretch guys. You yep. know, they gave him a lot of problems. Uh, 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 Lazuski gave him a lot of problem where he's, he's screening and popping. And, you know, I, I think – and we'll see. Duke's different because Duke doesn't have guys like that. I said this. I don't think Duke's a strong outside shooting team. So, you know, I, I can see that being a tough matchup if they're making shots. But – uh I, I just think they've gotten better on that. And I think North Carolina will want revenge. It would not surprise me at all to see North Carolina get to the championship. And then you get there, man, anything can happen. And, you know, it, it, it's roll it out, play 40 minutes, let the best man win. 
So what I, what I like about anything, anything can happen. And I think they could very well get the championship game. Cause like I said, on that lower bracket, the South bracket, they are the best team on that side, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with you. And they, and they are kind of built to play in a tournament. They, they got good guard play. They got multiple guys that can handle the ball. They pass well. And it's not just them. Like everybody in that starting five passes well. I've chronicled uh, Brady Maddox assist numbers a lot here in the last couple of weeks. I think the chemistry is very high. They picked up their lunch pails. They all carry lunch pails in the court. They, I think collectively they're better individually on the ball defensively, but they're also better collectively defensively playing off the ball. You, know, you don't see them just blowing help defense as much as you did earlier in the year. They're doing, I think fundamentally they're a lot, lot better in some of those areas. They're more confident and they look, they had four guys score 20 points against Duke. David, that's the first time in Carolina history four guys scored 20 points in the same game. So I said something about how Syracuse has guys who can score. Carolina does too, and they can do it in more variety of ways. They can drive. They can hit from the outside. They got enough rebounder. They got a stud in the middle who can do so many things for them. So I do think Carolina is, is certainly well positioned to make a run. I just question – I probably shouldn't question the legs. I've been telling people for five weeks, stop worrying about it. This is who they are. It's the old Gene Hackman. My team is on the court deal. But I do think with the ACC being down and Carolina is ascending clearly, maybe they continue to ascend. I, I've said a couple of times, they remind me a little bit of UCLA last year. And if that's the case, just keep ascending. And if you keep ascending, you win and you keep playing. You win, you keep playing. I could see them meeting Duke again. That'd be fun. I, I'm, I have no problem. I have no problem with Duke Carolina games. They're always you great. Stole, you stole my thunder. Uh, because that's where I was going to go. I was going to say, let's talk about the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is Duke, North Carolina, number three. Okay? And because, like I said, North Carolina is the most talented team on their side. Duke's the most talented team on their side. Um, But like I said, I, I, I think North Carolina, I think Duke, rather, I think they got a tougher bracket than North Carolina does. But yeah. – Let's say they get to that game, which could very well happen. I, I think Duke, North Carolina is a very, very viable option. I don't think that's a long stretch, or any stretch of the imagination, that that's a long shot. What do you, what do you want to see happen? What do you want to see happen? Let, let me say this. Yeah. North Carolina's win over Duke, I'm going to close the way I opened up. It was not a fluke. Okay. The second half of that game, North Carolina scored much easier than Duke scored. They had better misses than Duke. Duke had to work. North Carolina got whatever they wanted, whenever they they got it. So it's like if you went into a football game and you said, you know what, between the tackles, they ain't got it. We got a big offensive line. We got a bell cow running back. We're going to go at – or if you said, you know something, they got two freshmen out there on the corners that can't guard our wide receivers. So what are you doing? They, they can't – they can't uh, stop our we, – we don't have to blitz to get to the quarterback. They can't block our, our defensive line, get to – from applying quarterback pressure. North Carolina has got that going in where there's – where you could say, you put Baycott in the middle, well, that ball screen – Yep. Duke don't have anything for it. So if they play, Duke's got to come up with an answer because, like I said, the better team won Saturday night. That doesn't mean North Carolina's the better team. Overall, they were the better team that night. But if I'm, it's all about matchups, and Duke has a very, very, very tough time guarding North Carolina. Do you want to see round three? Absolutely. Yeah. I think they – you won't have if you don't I mean, have Coach K can give a speech how it was his final game in uh, Brooklyn. Oh boy, man! New York that's City, a... New York City, and all that. That that's a that's a Duke town, isn't it? Jerry Seinfeld yeah. can do another game. That's a Duke. Yeah, town. that. Yeah, that I. They think it is. I mean, they used to. Gonzaga, Duke played a quote-unquote road game against Gonzaga in, in New York. So, 
Yeah, it's they crazy. Play, they like to play a game up there. Every year. You go back to you know to Hubie Brown. Oh, and, I know, yeah. and all that. Oh, and you, Dean, you know. Dean used to play a game up there. Hubert says he wants to play a game up there all the time. So we'll see. I do think that Duke likes to think that it is, but uh, it will be interesting. I would love. I wouldn't have any problem seeing it. I've seen. I've done. I've covered fifty-seven. I have no problem covering number fifty-eight here next week. So if that does happen. That tells me that the Tar Heels have learned a lot and have were able to cut the cord to the other night, which to me is a significant sign of growth. And that's ultimately what I zero in on when I'm covering. That, that means uh, that means that you could do another. Uh, you'll be doing another boot North Carolina press conference, and and, and you can ask them uh, why they blew off North Carolina coaches in the handshake line. <laughs> Yeah, I also saw that Nolan Smith just kind of did man, this. I, I, I'm a big Nolan Smith guy. I, I really liked him when I covered him, and I like you know, a little fist bump every once in a while. He's a wonderfully nice guy. He's got a great story, as I know that you're well aware of. But this is a rivalry. It's heated, and when you're in the middle of a rivalry and it's heated, sometimes irrational thoughts don't always prevail, as we've seen. And uh, so I don't have a, I don't have a problem with any of that. I don't have a problem with Carolina not giving K anything. I don't have a problem with it with uh, you know, some of the stuff I heard coming out of the mouths of Duke people toward Carolina last night. That's, that's what it's all about. That's the way it should be. You're not supposed to you know, brush your, put your, your rival's hair and, and lay out the red carpet for them. Screw that. Just go out there and beat them and, and fight them and do all that kind of stuff. It makes it better for guys like me who are Switzerland in this whole deal. Man, you're getting, you're getting down the gutter. Yeah, get in the gutter. I like it. That's what rivalry's all about. And this is coming from a guy who thought Carolina should have given him something to begin with, but I've sort of changed my mind on that. I just, Brett Friedlander actually convinced me. He's a guy that I did the podcast with last week. He's like, you know what? It's a rivalry. You don't need to. They respect each other. They really do respect each other. I know I covered both programs for years. They absolutely respect each other, but they don't have to like each other. And if you don't like someone, why fake a gift? Just get out there and play. Yeah. Round three could be coming up. David. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate yes, it. He's David. I'm AJ. We appreciate you stopping by.